So we're live broadcasting. Hi. Okay, hi. Hi. You say hi and then you want to go. Okay, say bye. Go on. Go. All right. Let's start. Let's play our. very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is George Jarrett Helm Jr. I was born and raised in Kalamula, the homestead site. Went to Honolulu to get an education. Instead, I lost my innocence. Hi. <laughs> I'm back with you two. I want to welcome everybody who's with us today and um, thank you, Jane, for introducing me to George Helm. That was fantastic. We'll come back to him. I'm Kelly Seacat, and I'm the director of the Lucas Artist Program at the Montalvo Arts Center. And um, joining me today is Nathan Zanon, my colleague, who you cannot see, and Jane Cheng Mi, along with Ulrich Lopez. And I'm delighted to have you both here today Montalvo started a project almost two years ago, looking at the loneliness epidemic and how it was growing and what it means and, and how we could combat it as an art center, as a public park, as a place that has an active artist residency, how we could turn to our artists and think about loneliness and, and how we might take this on. And little did we ever suspect that we would find ourselves in a pandemic that is requesting us and requiring us to isolate and self-isolate in order to care for one another. Um, and then, you know, we find ourselves in another cultural kind of pandemic where we're needing to really look at how we care for each other more deeply as a humanity, as a civilization. Um, but I think our as we went into this pandemic, we put together an exhibition last year called Alone. And it was inspired by two curators. They go by the collaborative name of Vignettes. It was a project they had done in 2018 in the city of Seattle. And we were delighted to bring the project to the Bay Area. Together we curated in 
six artists to respond to the idea of loneliness and isolation in an urban setting. And Jane Cheng Mi was one of the artists we selected. Jane is an ocean engineer and an artist who assesses the post-colonial ocean environment through an interdisciplinary and research-based lens. She examines the narratives associated with the underwater landscape, considering the past, present, and future. Me most often focuses on the occupation and militarization of the Pacific Ocean by the United States, as her livelihood would have reinforced the legacy of the American military complex. The ocean has always played a large role in her life. She's been an avid scuba diver for over 25 years. She was the inaugural artist in residence at the World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument, researching the pre-contact history of Pearl Harbor. Her work's been exhibited nationally and internationally, most recently at T. Uru Watakiri and St. Paul Street Gallery in New Zealand, in Otearoa. Otearoa? Close. She's been a scientist on the Arctic Circle Prog on the Arctic Circle Program, a recipient of the University of California Institute of Research in the Arts grant, and a fellow at the East West Center at the University of Hawaii Manoa. She's currently based out of Honolulu and Los Angeles, where she teaches at Scripps College. For our conversation today, Jane invited Ulrich Lopez to join us. Ulrich is a longtime friend, colleague, artist, and he also participated in supporting Jane's project as part of the Lonesome Exhibition. Ulrich Lopez was born in Mexico City. He lives and works between Mexico City and San Juan, Puerto Rico. The bachelor's degree in sculpture and industrial design from the Escuela de Artes Plásticas de Puerto Rico and in 2012 was part of the SOMA summer program in Mexico City. <clears throat> Rick is part of the independent program La, Practice, La, La Practicia in Beta Local, Puerto Rico from 2013 to 2014. He has participated in residents such as Artiste Village Warp, Contemporary Art Platform, Genk, Belgium, Front Ground, Merida, Yucatan, Clock Tower, and Mana, Miami, and most recently, Flora Ars Natura in Bogota, Colombia. Lopez has exhibited in several galleries, museums, and alternative spaces in Puerto Rico, in Mexico, Spain, Colombia, United Kingdom, and the United States. His most recent show includes Never Spoken Again, which was at the Michigan State University Brood Museum, and Sharjan, Biennial 14, Leaving the Echo Chamber, Sharjan, in Galleria Augustina, Ferreira, Mexico City. So they really put me to the test, but we're gonna talk a lot about language today, and I'm gonna start with Jane. Jane, I'm gonna turn on a PowerPoint just to show a couple of images from the Lonesome Project, as we, as we talk, but I'd like you to just address how you sort of thought about Lonesome, how you thought about the exhibition and why you chose the project you chose, which is entitled Of the Ocean. Thanks Kelly and thanks Nathan. Um, before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge that every, to everyone that I'm joining from Los Angeles or Tongva Gabrielino land. Um, and also just a little bit about myself. I'm of Chinese and Taiwanese heritage, but um, am American. Um, and like Kelly said, I'm both an artist and um, ocean engineer. Um, so in talking to Sarah and Sierra, um, we had numerous conversations about acknowledgements and also geographies. Um, I believe Sierra came across my work through the Creative Independent, um, and a lot of it was about the ocean, obviously, because that's the topic um, that I kind of circle around with all of my work. Um, and so we really wanted to produce something that kind of challenged the norm 
of acknowledgement, but also also talked about translation and language. Um, I've been really interested in translation for a couple of years now, um, in particular, kind of what gets translated and why and what languages are utilized in translation. So in California, we have a lot of things that are translated into Spanish. Um, and we also have a lot of things that are translated into Chinese. And so having the opportunity to be um, utilizing bus transit shelters, um, we were thinking about what languages were spoken or unspoken um, throughout the United States. Um, and this is also because I'm a relatively new mom. You guys might have met Kai if you came in a little bit early. Um, I've been really interested in thinking about the languages he's going to learn. Um, and I was reading Robin Wall Kimmer's Braiding Sweetgrass, which talks about how um, in her native tongue, Patawame is made up of 70% verbs, whereas English is made up of 30% verbs and how that situates oneself and one's understanding of the world um, through language, right? So if you have um, things that are more verb-based, everything has a certain reverberation and doesn't necessarily have, um, isn't necessarily in a fixed state and how that, that also really relates to, for instance, um, like the coastal ocean, the way that the tides and the borders are constantly in flux. And so our worldview can change the more languages we know. Um, unfortunately, across the United States, because of a lot of the boarding schools, many of the indigenous and Native American languages um, are not spoken nearly as much. Um, I've been really fortunate to spend a lot of time in Hawaii. Um, and so uh, hearing Hawaiian and learning from the culture of those islands has been really um, nurturing for me to understand another worldview, um, which is very different than having grown up in California, the way that we, um, even the education system, I believe Kelly and I were talking the other day about you know, how in fourth grade, everyone has to make missions or in fifth grade, everyone has to do hero projects and this type of education and what it, what it does to, um, the way that we think and maybe the way that things are viewed. Um, and so going back to that education, when I was younger, I spoke Mandarin and Chinese, um, but I remember this story when I was five, uh, I was, my, my mother was told that I should only be spoken English to, so I would learn um, English better. And so my mom actually took me out of school and sent me to Taiwan to live with my grandparents. I don't know if that was the reason, but coincidentally, um, a year later, that's that's happened. And so this kind of, the story has always kind of stayed with me and I'm interested in seeing and hearing more diverse languages. Um, I myself have studied a number of languages, but even am not necessarily fluent, you know, Spanish, German, um, Arabic and Tibetan, for instance. Um, and so these posters in particular acknowledge um, five inhabited territories of the United States. There are actually other, um, unoccupied quote unquote places um, of the United States. And so these five places um, are American Samoa, Guam, the Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. And all five of these territories consist of islands surrounded by the ocean. So this work in particular seeks to recognize the indigenous peoples of these locales by including this statement in their language. This is on the bottom of the poster right there. Um, um, Moving towards a plurality, the ocean is common to these islands exceeding their colonization by the United States. So these posters acknowledge the ocean as a complex region. And they're actually drawn from um, NASA missions where astronauts surveyed the earth from space in isolation. So uh, I think inspired by this, these conversations I was having with Sierra and Sarah, um, I also wanted to make it somewhat of a collaborative project and they have quite a few friends um, though I haven't actually visited any of these places, I've had a lot of interest um, in the last couple of years as I expand my practice to visit them and have been in conversation with a number of people um, like you'll Rick about visiting. Um, and so this was kind of a further inspiration to work given, given the collaborative nature of vignettes and the collaborative nature of this project to um, work with others. Thank you, Jane. Clearly, I need to figure out how to work this PowerPoint a little better. We did a test. Um, I love this project. I love that you brought 
brought language and culture and, and kind of these spaces in the ocean into the conversation about, you know, how we think about our humanity, how we think about isolation. So it's been a treat to have it up. Um, I know today you're on your way up here to see the work for the first time, visit family in the Bay Area. So that's really terrific. I'm going to do... Um, I'm going to do the screen share again, Ulrich, and I just want you to talk a little bit about your practice. You may mention um, a bit of the work, how you and Jane met, um, but I want to thank you on behalf of Jane and the project for just getting involved and really coming in to help her with the translation, particularly of Puerto Rico. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, Kelly and Jane, for the invitation. Uh, and everyone who's watching. Uh, yes, I guess I can do a brief introduction, maybe just as Jane did. Like Kelly explained, I was originally born in Mexico, but lived most of my life in Puerto Rico. Uh, so I have sort of like that mixed background. And uh, in regards, I mean, well, I met Jane way back in 2000. <laughs> Uh, we did a sort of like a residency uh, together and uh, since then we've always kept in touch I guess because we have certain interests uh, in common and uh, and uh, fortunately we've kept in touch over the years and we've seen each other both in LA and in Mexico here uh, and kept in touch with our in our similar interests. Um, and just to talk a little bit about my work or my practice, uh, most of it is sort of is interested in the human material production or the studies of human material pro production, specifically our, our archaeology uh, from the Americas and the Caribbean, but also how that sort of translates to um, to mod, what we could call modern archaeology or archaeology, what I think of archaeology for the, for what could be the people who are present uh, rather than, than for the dead. Uh, and an example of sort of that combination which sometimes uh, is direct to certain archives or objects in archaeology is, uh, is this project uh, which Kelly uh, is shown here in an image which was called uh, Caribbean prologue, uh, sort of uh, would be this translation prologue, yeah, um, which was done in 2000 between 2015 and 2016 here in Mexico. I uh, was given a grant to sort of study. I wanted to study the similarities coming from two those two different backgrounds. Uh, at least in the Caribbean region, mo, mo, uh, there's, there's always been a focus on the islands and what would be called the insular Caribbean, but there's also now more studies and, and uh, research around the continental uh, conception of the Caribbean, which would be the shores that sort of look towards it. Mexico having one, uh, having two of those historical shores, uh, one being the peninsula of Yucatan and the other the Gulf of Mexico, part, where most of the Gulf of Mexico. So having these two backgrounds, I was really curious how those manifestations uh, uh, of the Caribbean, which are usually mentioned through uh, either the, the colonial past in terms of crops uh, or uh, the, the plantations, uh, architecture uh, and other practices, uh, I wanted to find out what would that be or what, what connections, like connections I could find in, in the Mexican uh, Caribbean region, which, which historically has lacked uh, the presence of the, of the Afro mixtures uh, that are more present in the Caribbean islands. So I was curious how those manifestations with the indigenous uh, communities there that were used for the, for the plantation labors. Uh, what, what we would find. So what I did was a trip through the whole region. Uh, it ended up in the destination that you saw in two, in two publications. One, which is the image here, which is sort of like a log of the different practices that I found. There were either uh, Creole versions of, of Mexico, uh, things that were similar through Mexico and the different islands I have been able to visit 
in the Caribbean and how how also like like a, a, a subject that crossed everything was how the ocean in architecture or in the geography or in these practices sort of was felt through. Uh, that's why in the installation there's some some screens uh, for insects there that is like a common thing uh, certain elements of architecture uh, the vehicle itself uh, uh, and sort of these publications narrate that and are like an archive of that experience uh, uh, which also highlighted a little bit my interest in terms of books and, and, and language as well which sort of relates to the project to Jane's project, uh, because most of the things I have found around the Caribbean are, you know, through studies and, and literature. And then I wanted to quickly mention another project, which also relates to this, which was done in collaboration <laughs> with two other Caribbean artists while I I have lived here in Mexico. Uh, Minia Biaviani, which is an artist from Guadeloupe, uh, which is uh, one of the offshore territories, territories of, of France, and Madeleine Jiménez Antil, uh, that's an artist from Dominican Republic who also lived in Mexico City. We all found each other here, sort of reading and interested in this, um, in this unity or sort of connections that the ocean uh, brings in the Caribbean. But also each of us had our own uh, sort of uh, interest uh, around the language and the text from writers that we were interested in and then how we couldn't find different versions of this uh, text in our, our languages uh, or even in Creole languages, which vary uh, greatly uh, between Haiti or the Creole in Guadalupe Martinique or what could be uh, like a, a Creole in Jamaica, which is Patois, or, inclu or including the Spanish sort of mixtures that come up in the Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico and all of this. So what we did in that project is a selection of texts from uh, really significant Caribbean writers and translate them into the one of uh, three main languages in the Caribbean, which are English, uh, Spanish and French. Uh, and they were like re really were sort of uh, tools for a series of workshops that we did in Mexico City in a space called Crater Invertido, who hosted the project. Uh, but they were distributed and reached uh, all kinds of places. Um, uh, but yeah, we wanted to sort of give enough other, other reach to text by like this, uh, this quote from Edward Glissant. Uh, this treaty of the the whole the todo mundo, which would be the the whole world, uh, uh, to sort of uh, uh, have um, more reach out. Uh, these ideas have more reach within the Caribbean itself, which sometimes, because of the geopolitical divisions of our colonial pasts, has been really hard. And I finish with that. Thank you, Ulrich. I think, Jane, I can't tell if folks can see us or just the PowerPoint, so I'm going to stay here so we can get rid of it after we look at the next image. I want you to talk a little bit about the Church of Life, but also the relationship to George Helm. And, you know, we played his, his video at the very start, and I know he's been an inspiration throughout your work, so you may speak about him and also in terms of... Um, your recent project of the ocean. Um, so to go into kind of further detail in regards to of the ocean um, and also Puerto Rico and these time periods, it's interesting um, that Ulrich goes into archeology span because the archive that I'm looking at is around the turn of the 18th and 19th century. And this is also, it's interesting to connect Puerto Rico, which is all the way over um, in the Caribbean to, you know, American Samoa, Guam, um, and the Mariana Islands. And, and, and Guam also, and the Philippines was a part of this as well, right? We're, we're Spanish colonies, and then also transitioned into the hands of the Germans. Um, and so there's this time period in the 1890s or so where all of these islands, including Hawaii, are tied together. Um, and then America essentially takes them over as well. Um, the Philippines gained their independence. Um, and so the islands are tied together in that way, but also 
um, kind of my introduction, it's interesting that George Helm says he goes to Honolulu and loses his innocence. My family had always traveled to the Hawaiian Islands um, in the summers to um, spend time in the ocean because my grandfather was a waterman um, and I eventually went there for graduate school um, and very quickly was introduced to um, things such as the Aloha Aina movement, um, which George Helm was a part of. Um, and he's really an inspiration because him and a, num a number of other um, Kumu or elders um, went to Kaholawe, um, where the American Navy was bombing um, after World War II all across the Pacific. Um, and you can also say in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, there, there's just, we're, we're constantly doing war games and testing um, in all these places as if it doesn't affect not only us, but the people who live there and the land that is there and the ocean that is there. Um, and so in the seventies, um, George Helm and the Kahalave Nine went to occupy Kahalave, which is off the coast of Maui um, and was being bombed. Um, and I think that that is really parallel to these five different inhabited territories as well as the other um, 14 occupied territories uh, that are being used um, often as target practice. And this can, can, this happens even today, right? We have RIMPAC exercises that are trying, everyone's trying to cancel them um, in Hawaii this year. Um, and so I think that in many ways, um, reading him or listening to his music um, and understanding um, his message is also really important um, and kind of opened up this understanding of what is, why it's called, for instance, why is, um, it, why is it called the Asia Pacific? That doesn't make any sense to me personally, right? But that, that is the theater of um, World War II, right? The Pacific theater. Now it's called the Indo-Pacific theater so that it's expanded all the way to India. And so why this grouping and why is everyone together that way? Even though they're different countries and different places with so many different cultures um, and, and I mean, a lot of the majority of the population of the world, right? Billions of people live in India and China, for instance. And why is it all together? Um, and so very eye-opening, I think, for my education and my understanding um, to read his words, to listen to his music, and then go further within the Aloha Aina movement um, to, learn, to learn about like what I would have been had I become an ocean engineer or I am an ocean engineer, but like practicing all the time instead of just doing like work for the national um, national park system or on occasion like scientific research, right? So. Thanks, Jane. I'm gonna stop with the screen sharing. It's, um, how did you turn to the arts? Um, well, my father's an architect, so it's kind of like the, the marriage was trained as an architect. He became a developer um, in Southern California. But um, I mean, it's kind of a long process. Uh, I mean, we always painted and drew. There was this woman in our town who you could go take um, oil painting classes with. But I feel like really there's this moment that um, I have this understanding in a lot of ways that there's a way to have the difficult conversations that we need to have as artists. And I think that that's, um, that's where art really, it, it explores these moments of research that, um, kind of, you're, you're drawing from moments of time and, and place that can can you can have a maybe more of a weaving instead of being so necessarily direct and so I find that a lot of these projects like even being able to have more conversations with Rorik lately have been really lovely and then also other people I've been working with on this project um, uh, across the ocean and and learning more myself um, and these conversations often um, people ask like well what you know, you can't say something direct has happened, happened, but I think these indirect things are really important. So uh, one of the projects I did um, about Pearl Harbor with the USS Arizona, um, it was really beautiful within six months to a year, even though I didn't have necessarily um, 
direct contact uh, with the Hokulea. The Hokulea sailed into Pearl Harbor and hadn't hadn't sailed there before. Um, and so things like that, I think, are why I'm an artist and why I'm really interested in art, to be able to have these conversations um, and these indirect indirect ways of being that, that are inspirational. So maybe hopefully someone will see this poster um, or drive by it, maybe take an extra look, go read the text, be excited that they see um, their language like represented and, and, and you know, like see, see that people care about Puerto Rico or Samoa or Guam, the Mariana Islands um, or the US Virgin Islands. So. And care about them not only as as beautiful places to go and visit, but as places that have a rich, deep cultural history. Yeah. And what both of you do so beautifully in your work, I think we're living in this moment that looking at histories and and how they kind of can help us propel to an imagining of a new kind of future, is really really powerful and important. There's something, Ulrich, in your sense, let me say, Samarillo project, the, the post yeah. we saw with the multiple languages, similar to Jane's project, that talks about this swirling of the ocean and where all of these cultures sort of are swirling together to create the Creole. I mean, I know Creole, I know Creole food, I know that it's coming from many, many backgrounds and that's where it starts. You get introduced maybe to a food. I had a conversation Jane and I had early on where she said, you think about the ocean covers the majority of, of, of the globe, of the earth. You know, we call it land and we call it earth, but we don't call it ocean. So there's something, there's some depth of wisdom and knowledge held in that space. And I think these islands that sort of sit alone in that ocean are um, an incredible launching point. I don't know if you two want to speak to it. I want to add one more thing. My, my husband, being Filipino, is an island guy. And I am from Minnesota. I am from the middle of this continent. And I never understood what it means to visit an island. And so his love of Hawaii, his love of the Philippines, our, our visits to the Philippines, there's a whole different way of thinking. Um, and maybe you can both speak to that richness of culture and, and the way those cultures have been. You know, you alluded to it, Jane, or you, you spoke about it, you know, how in colonization, we've just sort of come in with new languages, come in with new military force, and we were just mowing over traditions and ritual and history and culture. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of things that are situated in a, in a place that are really, really important, right? Like um, California, we have fires, for instance, um, and whether that be, there, there's just, this communing with nature that um, an understanding of not only the land, but what things are named and that's like embedded within language. And so it just seems, I, I think that, you know, you you hear about the, the navigators and the wayfinders across the Pacific and going to all these different places and, and they speak multiple languages, right? And so um, in the United States, we just, we don't have that and we are not also acknowledging that we are settlers on this land um that native americans live here and that they had a language that communed um with the land with the ocean with the place well rick you grew up in puerto rico yeah partially yeah i think i i think of two things during this whole well the, the things that we just mentioned and how strong, I mean, how important, at least in the Caribbean language is to each of the islands, but also sort of the, as a, as a, as a thing of resistance, specifically, for example, in Puerto Rico, Spanish, uh, uh, even though we have two official, sort of official uh, languages, which are Spanish and English, most people day-to-day the, -day speak Spanish and it's seen I think uh, greatly as uh, stands of resistance. And uh, for example, while in Mexico, I met one of the, I had the privilege to meet one of the great uh, historians of, of the 
for Hispanic Times uh, that he just unfortunately passed away last year. And Miguel Leon Portilla, he's one of the great translators of Nahuatl texts. And I made him shortly and uh, I was introduced as a Puerto Rican and he, even he, I was really impressed because he mentioned how language was really significant in Puerto Rico as a, sort of as a political stance. Uh, and then, which I know he, he understood greatly because he saw in a pre-Hispanic, uh, like indigenous language in Mexico as a, a really important aspect of it. Um, so I think that is really interesting in sort of the project uh, on what Jane is, is doing. Uh, and um, yes, and then I think of, uh, of uh, how sort of this, these two places, you know, the, the sort of the, that side of the sea, uh, which uh, Jane uh, is mainly studying in the Pacific. And then I think of like the historical uh, context of the Caribbean. There's even a writer, a Cuban writer who says that we should, uh, there should be a, uh, time should be divided. You've just muted yourself, Ulrich. By accident, you. Sorry, I had a. Who should a, be divided? I had a a, a phone call. Sorry, <laughs> and it, it, it muted me automatically. Uh, no, I was mentioning how I'm I'm really interested, or it's sort of in around my interest in archaeology is also sort of like a historical interest, or the or the the interest in in how. Um, everything, at least for me and, and certain writer, writers, you know, the history in the Caribbean, in the Americas, both North and South, really starts through the Caribbean, uh, which were the original land, lands that uh, were the, the Spaniards uh, sort of landed. Uh, and um, a writer, a Cuban writer even claims, sort of does, does a statement, which is, which is the name of uh, sort of like the project I showed about the trip in Mexico. Which he, where he basically states how time should be measured, not uh, AC or BC because, because of Christ, but, but before and after the Caribbean. Because for him, that's sort of like where history really shifts. So I'm really interested in, in, in those shifts and in those uh, political conflicts and sort of uh, connections uh, in, this, in this region. And, I, and it's a thing that I keep coming back to uh, in one way or another through my, through my projects or my practice. I, um, I wonder as both of you think so deeply about sort of these cultures, these places, the, you know, and language, which to me is fascinating, you know, helping me figure out my own pronunciation. I speak English, right? And that idea will never leave my mind that, you know, only about 30% of the English language is verbs. And, and how does that start to shape how you think about the world? And I think that's fascinating. Um, we have a lot more work to do there in thinking about that. My question, I guess, is um, what kinds of, of, kinds of pearls, and I'm sure there's many, 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 that do you kind of see in your research, in your work that could lend itself to sort of thinking about futures and thinking about visioning. And, and it's a question I'm interested in, just overall. I'm actually teaching a class called Futuring <laughs> um, at Scripps next are. semester. It's a core class. Um, I, I think that this actually ties back a little bit to the George Helm piece, I can speak about it. Um, somebody I've worked really closely with in Hawaii is Josh Tangan. Um, and he did the Pohono Society um, has done five years of a show called Contact. Um, and the one that the George Helm piece was in was in the missions, um, in the Hawaiian mission buildings. And so we were talking about um, missionization essentially and that that conversation with Hawaii and that also occurred all over um, it's actually one of the reasons why my family is in the United States now um, across China as well um, and Taiwan um, but one of the one of the one of the contacts that I actually didn't end up participating in um, was imagining um, 
Hawaii in 2017, I believe was the date. Um, and so this idea of imagine your future and take it, I think that that's really important really ne right now, given the political circumstances going on in the world in the United States. Um, and uh, actually, um, Utameta Bauer of NTUCCA pointed out to me, I think maybe last summer, that the New York Times was having these op-eds of being written in the future. So people, um, futurists and artists and scientists were um, writing op-ed uh, essays that occurred 5, 10, 50, 100, 200 years from now. Um, and so there's an entire column. And so um, my class kind of touches upon that. Um, in regards to like how we imagine our futures. So there's like Afrofuturism as a movement, there's Sinofuturism um, as well as indigenous futures. And I think that that ability to see ourselves in the future is really, really important. Um, I live in South Pasadena um, and Octavia Butler, um, her archive is being held in the Huntington Library and obviously her works um, do the same, right? In regards to reimagine it's a, a little too real in a lot of ways when you read um, the parable of the sour and and you know talking about raising rabbits um and things like that especially with what's going on in the united states um so i think that this is a this is a really really important thing is that we study history all the time but should we be studying the future and imagining the future as to um what we would like to see i think that that's a question that that we constantly should be asking ourselves well, I, and I think both need to go hand in hand at this point. We, we're realizing in this moment, there's so little understood really about histories. And for a long time with the artists through our residency, we've been unpacking those kind of stories of history that people don't know. And that's the work you both are doing, but also kind of to simultaneously be thinking towards the future. Ulrich, I have a question for you. I know, you know, you come out of a visual arts practice, a conceptual practice, but you're really moving into theater and, and dance and, and how you're thinking about kind of theater and dance as you think about your work. Yeah. Yeah, in the last, I guess, uh, would be two years, I got really interested in, um, for initially in one of the like younger fields of, of archeology, span which is, uh, it's called archeoacoustics or archeo, uh, music and homology as well, but it's basically a study of sound in certain arche uh, archaeological sites or instruments, uh, these types of, of studies. Um, but also in a way, there, I've, I've always had sort of, again, I've always been dealing with sort of like a, a balanced or uh, or um, sort of a, I don't want to, I don't want to call it a clash, but um, Sort of balancing out these two backgrounds, you know, Mexico, it's one of the, at least in, the, in Latin America and in the continent in general, is one of the, like the major uh, archaeology havens, you know, uh, the things that are still left in, in collections, uh, the people, the indigenous people, the descendants of, of, of those um, things that uh, are accumulated and collector are still there. And in the Caribbean, which has always been sort of like a, it's always been perceived as a lesser place to study archaeology, just because there is not the amount of objects or architecture uh, left uh, as, as in other countries like Colombia or Peru. Uh, there's always been this sort of like interest way in how to look at, at the absence of things and then sort of the things that uh, a place where does has a lot of things, but a connection between all of these places is the immaterial production of, of culture or, um, or traditions. And the Caribbean has always, I think, been a, a, major, a major sort of flag in that sense, uh, because three, three culture, it's always, it's always mentioned three, but it could be more, it's evolved to more uh, cultures were brought up in these places, most of them ex uh, deprived from their cultures and they had to make up something new. And most of it was either through dance or music or ephemeral practices. So I've been sort of moving my uh, original interests, which are still very present around objects uh, uh, to more, yes, ephemeral things such as dance or music and uh, 
theater, theater could be also a category. And just because I think it's sort of, um, it's sort of uh, also as a stance uh, of not, uh, for example, always leaning into written archives, um, which in some ways uh, we lack, uh, or we have, we have had other ways of oral traditions uh, to pass information. So it's sort of like a, a little bit of an interest and a stance in how those um, channels of, 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 ed, of communication and, uh, and learning are, are possible through art. Um, so somehow I've been moving towards those, uh, those fields, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about the, you know, as we know what happens when you remove a language, right? You remove a culture and, and you have, indigenous cultures are so often built on storytelling and on kind of the story and the myth and, and an oral tradition, not written, not, you know, a Western way of sort of capturing objects and whatnot. I'm curious how often either both of you are engaging with, with elders of, of communities as you're developing your work. Because I think that kind of intergenerational conversations are really significant. I'm just... yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I just met an elder in residence, um, Julia Bogani. I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right. She's the elder in residence at Pitzer College of part of the five Claremont Colleges. She actually works with um, quite a few artists in the Los Angeles area. So I look forward to working with her more. Um, in talking about indigenous futures, so I should mention um, two people who I really respect, who I think are Kumu is Noelani Arista. She's a Hawaiian um, scholar. She does a lot of work actually in the Hawaiian mission houses, um, but she's also doing a lot of work on indigenous AI with Jason Lewis. Um, he's at Concordia University um, in Canada and um, their modes of thinking. They wrote a paper last year um, that was published by MIT um, about indigenous futures and have been doing a lot of work about that that I think is really, really fascinating. Um, there's a lot of different people to speak to and ask questions of as well. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think that uh, not just talking to elders, but also um, having a collaborative practice is really, really important right now, especially since we are isolated. Um, being able to talk on the phone with Ulrich as he travels to Puerto Rico and Mexico, and then knowing that his family has moved to LA, like I'm kind of excited. Um, we also have a third friend, Javi. Um, maybe we should have included him. Sorry, that's Kai crying um, in the conversation. This is life working from home. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and so things like that, I think, are um, um, the way that we influence or kind of share with each other. I mean, talking to Sierra and Sarah also has been really incredible as well as yourself, Kelly. Um, I actually, um, Sarah has um, a young child too. So we met up in San Francisco and had um, food to eat. And I think that that's also an incredible thing about being an artist or being a part of a residency program is this ability to travel and convene with people. Um, though I do, of course, like I think speaking to elders is of the most importance. So you, you know what you're doing and why and like what is important. Um, but I think that um, this reminder to be collaborative and to be with each other is really like the future that we really need to look to. Like yeah, you. as in my case, um, well, there's again, there's sort of a divide. I, Mexico, I think the, the people, the descendants from the people of, of certain things I'm interested in is really live and present. And I try to engage it in projects Especially, for example, in projects regarding craft, or I've myself take, taken, you know, several workshops around craft because it, I think there's a sort of like a channel of knowledge uh, through those means uh, besides language or or interaction with elders. And in Puerto Rico or other parts of the Caribbean that I visited, uh, uh, I've been more interested um, in sort of in one of in uh, sort of like an idea or or a proposition uh, of one of the, you know, the most important writers, which is Edward Glissant from Martinique, um, which is sort of, I, I think uh, he, 
he, or I'm really interested in sort of his proposal or his writings regarding sort of the new, com the new creolizations or combinations or interactions that are happening. He sort of uh, states the Caribbean as a scenario that is happening. He sort of uh, precedes the, the whole global globalization movement. And he sort of sees the Caribbean as a, as a place of study in where different cultures sort of come together and then something new comes up and how those interactions should be fair or just or, or examined carefully. And in that sense, I'm interested in sort of uh, new versions of or, or, or those manifestations, for example, during that project where I travel in Mexico, I noticed in Mexico, there are a lot of indigenous languages, but a Creole per se, which which in the Caribbean is sort of like what happens in Haiti, which is not French per se, it's sort of a combination of, of African languages with the native languages and then uh, also French, uh, uh, which has variations in different islands of the Caribbean. But in, for example, in Mexico and the peninsula of Yucatan, the Mayan descendants are now making mixtures of Mayan and Spanish and, and also Spanish uh, language or, or what we could would call slang, which can sort of also have mixtures from the influence of the United States, uh, which is our uh, Mexico's neighbor and has a lot of impact in that sense. And, uh, and how we appropriate it, the English language into Spanish. Uh, so sort of seeing that and, and thinking how that could maybe a, sort of like a new manifestation of Creole within Mexico uh, with indigenous uh, descendants uh, was you know one of the best or most fascinating things that uh, came up in that travel, uh, and even people who don't speak Mayan use Mayan terms instead of Spanish terms uh, for things like uh, for everyday things, which uh, I think was had a potential uh, uh, of this thing that we're talking about language. So I always try to keep at least uh, in my fascination with objects from the past and craft. I think that's sort of like a means that I'm trying to understand also through dance now and music to that, that idea of what our elders left, left to us. And then from that other side, I'm really interested in the potential of, of sort of these new experiences and, and, and things that mediums like this uh, and the isolation and internet uh, uh, create uh, sort of new, uh, yeah, new potentials of different things. Maybe not new, but just different and uh, uh, per different perceptions, yeah. That's great. So we have a, a group who's been with us the whole time and I wanna just see if there's any questions for either Ulrich or Jane. And if not, then I think Jane, we might like Ulrich to look at one additional project, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> just being mindful of time. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is a great project and I'm gonna do that screen share again. Apparently everybody still sees us when we're sharing the screen. So that's good to know from my end. Um, Ulrich, yeah. I'm gonna come to you. All right. <clears throat> Where could we see if there's any questions? There, it's. There you are. Oh, you oh, if you chat. wipe left. Yeah, yeah. I, I think okay. I opened the chat just in case I missed. No, no questions. No questions. So this project is is really quite spectacular. And, and Jane was telling me a little bit about it, but Ulrich, I'd love you to talk about what we're seeing here. And, and sure. give us some, we can see a little bit the scale um yeah okay so this is sort of like the first major project around dance that i've done um and uh, it is sort of hints that uh, also sort of like one of one of the deviations i have within all of all, like the practice i've mentioned uh, uh and con congregates it in, into one project but this was a project it's called pataki 1921 and it was done in the in last uh, last year's Sharjah Biennial in uh, the Emirates. Yeah. And uh, it's sort of uh, focused around um, around the, the figure uh, 
of Jose Raul Capablanca, which is a Cuban chess player. Uh, I mean, I was, I was, I've been, up, I've been sort of obsessed with chess uh, from a younger age, even though I'm not, uh, I wouldn't call myself a, a, a great chess player. Uh, but I was always interested, uh, at, at least at a certain point, where my interest uh, around the game moved more to the players and the history of it. Uh, sort of because I couldn't find, I identified myself sometimes with the game through players because there was there was a big lack, at least in the in the in the in like the initial search of of, of chess history. There's a, a lot of lack of Latin American presence in it. And uh, and it's and, and and the relation I had when I was young was chess was a game, you know, the European game of intelligence and all of this. But through sort of my my fascination with it and my studies uh, and then later studies around the history of it, there has only been one Latin American world champion of chess, and it's this Cuban player. Uh, he became champion in 1921. And um, so in this project, I, I was I was researching in Cuba another another chess player from Mexico, which I, I'm I'm really obsessed about, and he had a game against against uh, Fidel Castro, and it was done during um, the World Olymp the World Chess Olympics of 1966, which was the first major event of the, after the Cuban Revolution led by the Castros. Uh, and I was fascinated because they did a ballet in honor of the game where this Cuban player in 1921 becomes the, the world champion. Uh, and they did a major ballet in one of the stadiums in Havana. Uh, but at the same time, I was amazed in general with the chess Olympics, but I was sort of surprised that one of the major islands in the Caribbean and at least in this Spanish speaking Caribbean uh, which is Cuba, and also after the revolution became extremely important as like as a show or a pride of the Caribbean in our size to you know the United States or the rest of the world. Uh, I was really sort of let down that uh, they did a valet instead of uh, anything else that uh, Cuba has you know uh, uh, has uh, contributed in terms of culture to the Caribbean, which is dance of music. I think one of the most listened to musics are you know rumba or like every derived form of, of, of music from uh, song cubano and uh, which also highlights you know something that everyone thought the Cuban revolution highlighted which was sort of like the mixture of, of these cultures so it was really sort of like a letdown and sort of this project basically what does is sort of like a remake uh, to do some justice or what I think would be a justice uh, not only to recognize this player, which was a mixed, uh, a mixed race uh, player, uh, but also to that culture, with also, which also involves uh, religion and as uh, or syncretist religions, uh, particularly Santeria. So what I did was basically hire um, or collaborate more precisely, not just hire, collaborated with a, a dancer, a choreographer that specializes in Afro-Cuban and Afro West African dances and uh, I work with musicians who are part of the religion of Santeria back in Puerto Rico uh, and we sort of redid the same chess game the same idea of, uh, of the original idea of the ballet uh, into dance but also incorporated things that I that I work in my other practices uh, which I mentioned are uh, not only archaeology but like craft so I, I collaborated with artisans uh, with a fiber that's, that happens in South America and uh, South Central America and part of the Caribbean as well to make attires that it's a sort of like a practice that still goes on in the Caribbean but comes from uh, West African traditions, religious traditions. Uh, and it was sort of like a major big step uh, regarding this sort of idea of, of how to look at dance and music traditions and, referencing or hoping to make new sort of, uh, I don't know if myths, but Pataki within the religion is sort of like, a, it would be considered sort of like a myth. So that's also where the title comes from. Uh, and it was like, uh, as, as it may seem, at least in the images, it was a, it was a big endeavor. Chess has, chess, a chess game has 32 pieces. We had 30 dancers, um, Cuba, uh, Puerto Rican dancers, 
uh, and dancers from the region, um, my musicians. So it was it was a really intricate project, and uh, and hopefully um, we're gonna have it next year in the Caribbean, which I think uh, I'm I'm really grateful for Sarja for you know for making this possible. But I think it's really important that it also happens uh, within the region. Um, with people who are fluent with the dance and with the music, even though my dancers, would, which most of them had um, hip hop background and bebop and all of this, which was really great because it's sort of like a, one of the strains from uh, Af Afro dances. Uh, so yeah, that was sort of it. <laughs> or like a summary, like a summary of that project. Yeah, I, um... I want to see it live. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I can't thank you both enough, Jane, for your participation with the exhibition, Ulrich, for joining us today, but but more so for your work, the work you're doing. And, and I think it is true, Jane, as an artist, you get to have these conversations, host these conversations, put the questions forward. And, and this is an important time. I love this kind of swirling of culture, this kind of idea of Creole and thinking about that as we move forward. So given our time, I want to kind of be mindful and I know you're heading north, Jane. I am, I will see you on Saturday. So Socially will, distanced with Matt. I will get to see you on Saturday. <laughs> and, and you both know well, we host the Lucas Artist Program at Montalvo and in some moment, we're going to get you, Jane, threatened. What would it be like to have me and Ulrich around the table talking to <laughs> um, Donna Conwell, who's joining me on the chat right now, our curator and myself, would love that. There's awesome. a lot, a lot to think about to continue this conversation. Before we go, I want to um, just let people know that we'll have a conversation each Thursday at noon with the rest of our artists. And lonesome. Next week, we'll be speaking with Modesto Covarubias, who will be joined by Constant Lewis, Chris Evans, and Ernest Jolly. Uh, they're the founders of the Oakland Idora Project. And for Modesto, the question is, what's going on? <laughs> Montalvo is also <laughs> hosting a fundraiser on Sunday evening, 5 o'clock. It's free. You can get online and sign up. Um, and it's just to continue supporting our artists and, and the work we do during this time. So I thank you both. Enjoy Mexico City. Thank um, you both. One day meeting you, Ulrich, and thank you, Jane. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, Jane, for the invitation. Invited <laughs> as well. Okay. See you guys. See you guys. Bye. Bye. I see you later. <laughs> Thank you.